All right, welcome to Equipping Hour, and come on in and find your seat. And we're going to get started this morning with a word on forgiveness. Now let me open us in a word of prayer, and we'll ask the Lord's help. Lord, we come to you this morning, and we ask for your help. We ask for your help to be impacted by your word and by your truth. We pray this morning for true life change. I pray that we would be melted by your grace. That we would be softened and pliable before you. And that our own humility being broken under your love would produce a disposition towards others of love and forgiveness, a willingness to be wronged rather than to eke out justice. Lord, this is a difficult topic for us, and yet it should be so easy. Help us in it for your glory, for the sake of the gospel, for the building up of your church, for our own liberation from slavery to bitterness. Help us to be people who quickly and easily forgive. We ask for your help in it, in Jesus' name. Uh, you heard from my prayer this morning the themes of this equipping hour. In equipping hour, uh, you never know what you're going to get. It's something of a smorgasbord uh, by design. Uh, sometimes you'll hear church history or biography or missions, sometimes a biblical counseling topic, uh, sometimes an exposition of a passage. Uh, here this morning, we're going to take up a, a heart topic that has some universal application. And I had sought to give a title to this message, Something about the liberating nature and the dynamic energy related to forgiveness. It sounded too much like a book titled The Freedom and Power of Forgiveness by John MacArthur. And so um, I kept trying to rewrite that title and realized I'm just stealing it anyway. So we're just going to call it Forgiveness. And I'm going to recommend to you MacArthur's book, The Freedom and Power and Forgiveness. You should read it. Uh, but this, this morning is not a book report. Uh, I hope to give us a, a flavor of the importance of forgiveness, in part because this is something we all wrestle with. As those who have been forgiven in the gospel, it's easy at times to want a pound of flesh or some temporal earthly justice out of somebody who has wronged us so grievously. This is a regular temptation because we are embattled by the residual effects of our own depravity, and we so easily forget what it means to have been forgiven. And so this has been a, a regular topic for uh, counseling appointments, um, for discipleship opportunities, for mutual encouragement in the body of Christ. Um, and, and I thought I would share with you what I have learned uh, and perhaps what you have learned, and what we often find reminding each other about. And that is this topic of forgiveness. So I'll say again that forgiveness should be easy for a Christian. It should be one of the easiest things we do. And it is very hard. I want to turn your attention to the example that Jesus gives that ought to motivate our readiness to forgive in Matthew chapter 18. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18. And a remarkable section about lost sheep and a lost coin and a prodigal son and the church discipline process and the pursuing those who run away. All of these things go together to paint a picture of what Christian's attitude must be towards other believers who are in trouble, uh, who sin and need restoration, who are lost and need to be found. It's helpful to read all of these sections together and not pull them out in, in isolation. What's interesting is we find in this section that includes the lost sheep, lost coin, uh, stumbling blocks that must be removed, and the church discipline process, this issue of forgiveness. 
After detailing the, the process whereby Christians are to carefully, lovingly help each other see their blind spots in the church, verse 21, Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And here, Peter is about to show off. He's acknowledging here, my brother, I ought to expect good things from my brother, and he's going to sin against me? My high privilege and position and character and name is going to be offended, but I'm going to be magnanimous and I'm going to forgive him. Not once, says Peter, not twice, but the perfect number, seven times. Of course, this uh, little bit of showing off magnanimity gets decimated by Jesus. Try 490. And, and I don't think Jesus is giving license to the 491st offense card for bitterness. Now, oh, my brother sinned against me. Seven times 70 plus one. Now I'm free to get my pound of flesh. That's not the point. This is not intended to be a precise number. It's designed to be an inexhaustible number. Your brother's going to sin against you in the same way 491 times in a row? I don't think that's the issue. Jesus blows the heart of forgiveness in Peter out of the water here. Look at verse 23. He tells a story to illustrate it. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had become to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Now, just think about the players here. There is a king, that is, he is sovereign. He gets his way. He's not obligated to anybody. Uh, somebody could ask him for a favor, and, and he doesn't owe anybody anything. He's the king. And there's a slave who is completely and totally beholden to the sovereign. And this slave owes the king money. Uh, you, you can't think of a more dire predicament than the lowliest on the social status owing the greatest, the most powerful, the sovereign, the one to whom he doesn't ha have to answer to anybody. And that's the one you owe money. And he owes him 10,000 units of money. They're, they're called talents here. Talent is a denomination of money in, in the first century Roman Empire. We, we like the word talent in English. It actually comes from this Greek word talent. Uh, we use it as a metaphor. Uh, somebody is given talents uh, to use and spend and invest in certain ways for a return to, to the investor. Uh, we use that as a metaphor and talk about relationships, time, uh, giftings, uh, musical abilities. Uh, we talk about somebody being talented. We, we are simply using this denominational money unit to describe things we've been given as a stewardship. This word talent was equivalent to 15 years wages of a day laborer. So think about your salary, if you have a salary, multiply it by 15. 15 years worth of salary. Now, how many talents did he owe him? 10,000. <laughs> we choke because that number, uh, like the 470 Jesus just listed, is an astronomical, incomputable number. Although, let's try to do some computations. The, the talent, by the way, was the biggest denomination in, in the monetary measurement. And 10,000 is the biggest number decreed. So take the biggest number that is named and multiply it by the biggest denomination of money. That's the number. And multiply that by 15. I mean, the, the number just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I did these computations a while ago before California made the minimum wage for fast food chains having more than 70 uh, franchises across the nation, $25 an hour. <laughs> Before that, I made these computations at $10 an hour. So bear with the math here just a little bit. At $10 an hour, 
10,000 talents or, or 15 years wages times 10,000 would be something like $3.75 trillion owed. At $10 an hour, if, if you couldn't pay that, if you didn't have the cash on hand and you had to take out a loan, say a 15% credit card, you would owe $532.5 billion annually in interest alone or $44.375 billion a month in interest. So it's obviously an insurmountable number, three and three quarter trillion dollars. I don't even know what the, that means. I, I, I can't put loaves of bread or, or car washes into that figure and come up with a number. It doesn't make any sense. But even the, the 532 billion owed in interest or 44 and... $0.375 billion a month owed in interest on, on such an amount. It just means it's an insurmountable figure that is only ever going to increase. A $10 an hour wage could never keep up with $44 billion a month more owed. The more you dig, the deeper the hole gets. And it's not even a comparison. It's like you're digging with a thimble. And the hole is being excavated by an earth mover. I, I don't mean one of those giant bulldozers in Utah in the open pit mines. I mean a bulldozer big enough to move the earth. It's, these are just staggering numbers. The, the original hearers would hear these numbers and be shocked. This is some sort of exaggeration. And then the story just gets stupid. Look at verse 25. Since he did not have the means to repay. Oh, really? His Lord commanded him to be sold, along with his wife and his children and all that he had, and repayment to be made, as if the man's belongings could make the king whole in what was owed. Therefore the slave fell to the ground, verse 26, and was prostrating himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay everything. What a foolish empty boast. And listen, you already know where this story is going. Uh, this is not a true historical narrative. This is a parable. Jesus introduced it as a parable of the kingdom. He's talking about spiritual things. He's talking about eternal life. He's talking about what sinners owe God in their debt of sin. And so this man offers fig leaves at the Garden of Eden. This man offers religion he offers sacraments and procedures and rule keeping. I'll pay back what I owe as if. Feeling compassion, verse 27. The Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. Who ate the cost of $3.75 trillion with infinitely accruing interest. <laughs> The king did. That slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him 100 denarii, and he seized him. <clears throat> and he began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. Now, this fellow slave owed a real debt to the first slave. It was a real offense. And if we keep the $10 an hour wage, <clears throat> this works out to approximately $8,000. So that's real. If I were owed $8,000 and I was living paycheck to paycheck, I, I think I'd want to see that. I, I, that's meaningful. It's significant that somebody owed this slave $8,000. That's a big amount for the people at this social strata. It's a big deal that that was owed and hadn't been repaid yet. That's an offense. It, it's real. It, it, it's tangible and it hurts. The slave went out and found that fellow slave, and he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. His fellow slave fell to the ground and was pleading with him, saying, and you hear the first slave's words coming back to him, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. This should be easy. I just got forgiven $3.75 trillion. 
and all the interest that would accrue faster than I could possibly do anything about it. I was forgiven an infinite debt. And you owe me 8,000 bucks? Have a nice day. It should be easy. He didn't do it. Verse 30, he was unwilling. And he went and he threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. This is merciless, unforgiving. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved. They came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. And of course, if we jump out of the metaphor, out of the parable into real life, the God of the universe, the King of all kings, the the Lord of all, the one we've offended, the one we owe an infinite debt, he knows everything. He sees everything. He sees straight through appearances and the whitewashed outer surfaces of our lives. He sees the heart. He knows the motives. He doesn't need somebody to come report these things. There are books that record every careless word, every evil deed. He knows it all. Summoning him, the Lord said to him, you wicked slave I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. How long would the torturers be in business with this man? Forever and ever and ever. How does a slave in prison, pay back an infinite debt that is only getting bigger every moment. He never does. And so we jump out of the parable to real life in verse 35. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does does not forgive his brother from your hearts. The stakes are high on this. Forgiveness in the heart of a Christian reveals forgiveness from the hand of God. And unforgiveness in the heart of a professing Christian will demonstrate the reality of unforgiveness from the heart of God. This is what's at stake in this issue. See, a Christian forgives, it's in the new nature. It is the appropriate and right response to forgiveness vertically from God. It's appropriate, it should be easy. But we're all sort of smirking at each other a little bit here because we know how hard forgiveness can be. And so what I want to do this morning is allow this illustration, this parable from Jesus to to prompt us to seek out help for forgiveness, for this tough task. We recognize residual depravity. We recognize the, the hangover of bitterness that so easily creeps in. So what do we do? How should we think? How should we live? Let's think first of all that Forgiveness is commanded for the Christian. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. Here in the Sermon on the Mount, verse 23. Jesus is describing a situation that was current in his own day. There was the temple, there were the sacrifices, there were the, the, the gifts given to God, votive offerings, free will offerings given to God at the temple in a very uh, physical, visible way. Uh, this is the outward workings of, of what God intended in the heart religion, working itself out in tangible expression. All of that was happening as Jesus is giving this instruction. And he says, therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar... And there, remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. Now, we don't have the temple. We don't have an altar. 
uh, those things are obsolete and gone. But the, the principle that Jesus teaches in that day stands. The outward religious expressions of things are hollowed out by unreconciled relationship. Repent in the heart. Go make restitution. Seek out your brother. Long for reconciliation. Because the external duties of religion, while the horizontal relationships are suffering, is a hypocrisy. Of course, in Matthew 18, the passage we were just looking at and the description of the church discipline process begins this way. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private between you and him alone. And if he listens to you, you've won your brother. There we have not, um, my brother has something against me, but I notice something in my brother. And Matthew 18, 15 doesn't specify that the sin described there is a sin against me personally. Although it, it, it would include that. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about choices you have when you're sinned against personally. But Matthew 18, 15 is more general. When your brother sins, and so the church discipline process is there for brothers and sisters in Christ to have each other's backs, to, to catch each other's blind spots and look out for one another and, and bring restoration where there is hard-heartedness and to do that one-on-one -on -one in private. And if the brother doesn't listen to the one, you take the two or three so that everything can be confirmed, not only the hard-heartedness in the brother, or if that's not the case, a, a really rotten accusation by the other. And those facts have to be established. And, and if, those are, if those are winsome in bringing your brother to a soft-hearted repentance, you've won. It's over. It doesn't go public. And then Jesus outlines the instructions for what to do next. Bring the entire church into the circle of love with the goal of restoration. And if that sinning so-called brother continues to stiff arm the gracious love of the church, he is to be removed. He is essentially dropped kicked the church out of his own life and says, I'd rather have my sin than your love and fellowship. And so he is not to be treated from that point as a brother until there is repentance and restoration, which is what the church longs for. But it's interesting, you have both the, your brother has something against you, go to him. And you see something in your brother, go to him. The impetus for initiation is on the individual believer to labor to make things right. When it comes to Matthew 18, 15, if your brother sins, that general statement, it, it regards the spiritual welfare of that brother. I'll just tell you, for me personally, I, I don't tend to apply this to personal offenses. We'll talk about the options you have uh, personally in a moment, but I would rather absorb the personal offense and address my brother when what is in view is his spiritual welfare. If we're around each other, if we talk at all where words are many, sin is sure to follow, if we rub shoulders with one another in the body of Christ, in fellowship, in families, in homes, we're going to sin against each other in word and deed often. In fact, if you're not sinning against each other, you're not close enough to each other, you're not actually following the one another pattern of body life in the New Testament. So the opportunities for sin are great, and if all we ever did was point out each other's sins, it's all we'd ever be doing because there's lots of it. And when it comes to personal offenses, I, I'm, I'm not liable to make personal offenses the, the category for corporate dealings. And I'm not saying that's a universal command. If you're sinned against personally, don't take it to church discipline. But I would say be wary of your motives. It is really hard to separate out the welfare of my brother and I personally got offended. I'm not smart enough over my own heart to sort that one out. It's just too easy for personal motivations to weasel their way into that process for me. 
the well-being of the brother is the governing principle. If it is out of a heart of love for a sinning brother with the goal of restoration, um, you're on much better ground. Some have said that forgiveness requires a transaction. You may have heard of the transactional forgiveness view. And, and there's something right about this view. It's not the view that I hold, but I want you to hear what's, what's right about it. Forgiveness has as its goal reconciliation. That is, two parties that are at odds needing to be reconciled and brought together. And in the gospel, forgiveness with God does not happen until there is a transaction. Uh, until there is repentance and faith. That, of course, is generated out of the work of the Holy Spirit in new birth. God for loves, predestines, calls, justifies. God does that work in the heart of a believer. The faith by which we believe the gospel is the work of God, Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. But still, in the forgiveness with God vertically, there is a transaction. I confess my sins. He is faithful and just to forgive me my sins. So does that apply to horizontal relationships? I would say there's something good and right about the transactional view in that we ought to seek for reconciliation. But I would say that if you hold the transactional view of forgiveness, you could be in danger of harboring bitterness until the transaction happens. And I want to give you an alternative view. Turn to Mark chapter 11. I understand the desire for a transaction and I understand the parallel to the gospel. But Jesus says something really interesting about forgiveness here in Mark eleven twenty-five. He says, whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. Well, that's an interesting statement. The picture is, whenever you stand praying, who are you with? Uh, maybe in the assembly, but you're with God. And who are you talking to? You're praying, you're talking to God. And as you stand praying, and I think the implication here, in your heart, forgive. That's the command. And this speaks to a readiness to extend the kind of mercy you've received from the Lord, a readiness to wash with grace the kind of grace you've received from God in Christ before the transaction can ever happen. So that when the transaction happens, if it does in this life, it is easy. You've been there already with the Lord and with your brother in your heart. And I would just suggest to you, if, if you wait for the moment, well, I can't forgive until they come to me and ask for it. You're sunk. I, I believe you actually are already harboring bitterness. And the allowing of bitterness in the heart is a, a germ, a seed that grows into disaster for you. A slavery for you. Again, back to MacArthur's title, The Freedom and Power of Forgiveness. The freedom side of that is, if you don't forgive, you're the one that's a slave. In unforgiveness in the heart, you think that you've got your opponent in some sort of cage. I'm not forgiving him. Watch this. I've got him locked up. You're the one locked up. <laughs> You're locked up in a, in a heart of bitterness that will not get out and will not let it go. This perspective, Mark eleven twenty five, 25, is, is liberating. Turn to Matthew chapter 6. In verse 12, do you remember how Jesus taught his disciples to pray? Our Father who is in heaven, vertical from the start, hallowed be your name, set apart be your name. Your kingdom come. This is eschatological, looking to the future when all is made right. Your will be done on earth, even as it is done in heaven. This is an appeal for things to go in my heart and beyond the way they already go in heaven. Give us our daily bread, a recognition of our dependence every day for our needs. 
and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And don't lead us into temptation. It's a prayer we ought to pray. And I don't mean in like a, a rote formula. I grew up in a church tradition that we prayed this every week out loud together as a church. It was helpful because I memorized it without trying. It was unhelpful because I forgot what it meant whenever I said it because it was too familiar. <laughs> but Jesus gave a pattern here for the disciples to pray. Types of content to launch petition to the Lord. And we ought to use it. We ought to employ it. In the parallel passage in the Gospels, uh, in Luke, it's worded differently. That's an indication that this is not a magic formula. But it is a guide for us to think about how to pray. These thoughts ought to be on our lips regularly. God, forgive me as that forgiveness goes out horizontally from me. In other words, this ought to be the heartbeat of the Christian life like breathing is. Part of regular prayer. If you prayed the disciples' prayer daily and meant the words, that would do a lot to chip away unforgiveness in the heart. I think that's Jesus' design. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. We're still in a, a section this morning. I didn't give you an outline up top. And for that, I ask your forgiveness, and you have to give it. We're in a section on just forgiveness as a command from Scripture. Colossians chapter 3. Beginning in verse 12. So as the elect of God, holy and beloved... What a way to address Christians. <laughs> Elect, chosen by God, by grace, not because of anything you could have done, a release of $3.75 trillion with accruing interest. <laughs> grace. They're also called holy, set apart unto God, belonging to the Lord. You're His. You're not your own anymore. And beloved. That word has some teeth to it, except that's the wrong picture. <laughs> These don't hurt. This has the, the bite of accountability of, oh yes, I'm loved by God. How good is it to be loved by God? What if I weren't? Oh, I am. Thank you, Lord. How could I not love others? The love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit and it flows outward and horizontally to everyone we meet. That's the idea. Do you remember that you're loved? What a description. All of that is a platform for this command. Put on a heart of compassion. Uh, already a heart of compassion. We're not talking about externals. We're not talking about formalities or formulas. Say the right things and fix a relationship. But a heart of compassion. What is it like to have compassion for an opponent? You're not trying to defend yourself. You're trying to help the opponent. Put on a heart of kindness. This just goodness expressed in relationship. Put on a heart of humility. Uh, not thinking more highly of yourself than you ought of gentleness, like your Savior. How has He dealt with us so gently? Go therefore and do likewise, Paul says. And patience, that bearing along with others when wronged. He expands on that in verse 13, bearing with one another and graciously forgiving each other. And then notice what he says about this. Whoever has a complaint against anyone. He doesn't say sin, debt, or trespass. That's interesting. Of course, a complaint could be over a sin, debt, or trespass. But it could just be a complaint. Maybe there's a difference over preferences. Maybe there's just something that was said without malice, but that didn't land right and, and was hard to hear. 
All of these fall under the rubric here of bearing with one another, forgiving one another. And then the trump card, verse 13, just as the Lord graciously forgave you. Could we really rise to that level? Could finite levels of transactional forgiveness rise to the level of the infinite transaction on our behalf in the gospel? Not even close. This is an argument from the minuscule to infinitude. Christians, you can do this. Forgiveness ought to be easy. And we're acknowledging even the way these commands are given to us here that this is hard. Turn to 2 Timothy 2. Still in the category of Christians being commanded to be forgiving people. Verse 24. The Lord's slave must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged. With gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. And, and notice the motivation, even when correction must come into play. Verse 25. If perhaps God may give them repentance, leading to the full knowledge of the truth... And they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. And, and this argument for forgiveness, for being patient when wronged, is in a context of interaction with opponents who are unbelievers. They are said in this passage to be ensnared by Satan, held captive to do his will. Uh, the most fearsome predator in the Amazon jungle, of course, there may be a lot there we don't know about, is the bullet ant. You think an ant, is that, is that worse than a, a leopard or, or some giant anaconda or, or uh, something else lurking in the dark forest? Well, the bullet ant has no enemies. The bullet ant is at the top of its food chain, and the bullet ant is at the number one spot on the Schmidt Pain Sting Index. And the scientist, Schmidt, decided he would scientifically try out all the most painful insect stings in the world. And so he would put them in, on his arm and provoke them to sting him and then measure the effect. Uh, second on the list is native to Arizona. It's the Pepsis wasp, the tarantula hawk that hunts down tarantulas and, and drags the carcass of a tarantula back to its hole in the ground and, and lays her eggs on the tarantula to, to uh, pupate and, and grow in the nest until they come out as... Have you, have you seen the tarantula hawk? It's about that big with a black-blue body and orange wings. Sounds like a small helicopter. They're fascinating. But that's number two on the list. Number one on the list is the bullet ant, which Schmidt says feels like being uh, shot with a gun that it, whose bullets have been heated in a hot furnace. And he goes on and on and on. He describes it like your wine tasting or, or coffee tasting. And, and the bullet ant uh, groups en masse to take down predators. Even manimal, uh, mammals and large animals become victims of the bullet ant. So you don't want to get caught by one of these. While at the top of the food chain, the bullet ant does have one enemy. And it is the fungal spores of a fungus that reproduces by getting inhaled by the bullet ant and then taking over the brain. It, it turns the ant into something like a zombie. So the central neural system of the ant dissolves, the fungus takes over, drives the ant's body to the mound where the fungal spores will then release and infect all the other ants, which will then drive like zombies to other places and affect other ants. It's the way the fungus reproduces. And so the ant is driven by the fungal will to do what the fungus wants. That's the picture of an unbeliever in this passage. Driven by Satan to do his will. Zombie dupes. And they can be your opponent. And you think, if there's anybody to be unforgiving to, it's that guy. 
And what is Paul's encouragement here? Hope. Lest perchance God may rescue them who are enslaved by Satan to do his will, that they may have eternal life. What's at stake in forgiveness? Gospel hope. Listen, this is the testimony of the witnesses throughout church history. This was Stephen praying for his enemies as they're throwing rocks at him until he dies. This is Paul being beheaded by Nero, Peter being crucified upside down. This is Polycarp in the fire. This is the whole train of church history martyrs who loved their enemies and prayed for those who persecuted them. Remember Stephen's last words? Forgive them. It's powerful. Saul himself became Paul in part because of God's working through such a man as Stephen. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. One more text here to belabor the point. Forgiveness is commanded. Ephesians 4.31. Here's what the new man in Christ in the gospel is directed towards. Let all bitterness and anger and wrath and shouting and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Instead, here's the replacement, be kind to one another tender-hearted, graciously forgiving each other, and the same trump card, just as God in Christ also has graciously forgiven you. Now, let me give you two options when sinned against. We, we've seen the commands, Christians must be forgiving. I would suggest to you there are two ways to do that. Both must be governed by love. Both must be driven by forgiveness. But you've got two options when somebody sins against you. You can cover it in love with a heart of forgiveness, 1 Peter 4, 7. Or you can address it in love with a heart of forgiveness. Let's look at 1 Peter 4, 7. Peter says, The end of all things is near, therefore be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love one another deeply, because love covers a sin or two. <laughs> uh, Peter says love covers a multitude of sins. Do you have that category in your toolbox? 490 plus <laughs> covered in love. Peter says that's what love does. Solomon said it is a virtue to a man to cover offenses. I hope you have that category. If you have the category that every sin you're aware of, every sin that is perpetrated against you must be addressed, then my friend, you have a low view of sin. You're not addressing nearly enough. Every sin must not be addressed. In fact, multitudes of sin must be covered in love. That's one option. The other option is forgive it in love. Address it in love from a heart of forgiveness. This is Galatians 6, 1 to 3. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each of you looking to yourself so that you will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. So really critical instructions for how to go about addressing sin when it's not the right time or place to cover it in love. But those are your two options. You don't have other options available. Bitterness, Hebrews 12, 15, do not let a root of bitterness spring up against you. It leads to apostasy and destruction under the Lord's wrath. You do not have the option of vengeance, Romans 12, 19. Do not take vengeance, my beloved, Again, that, that tag, beloved, is there on purpose. Remind you that you've been loved infinitely by God when you were at your worst. So don't take vengeance. And Paul goes on there in Romans 12 to say, leave room for the wrath. How much room do you have to leave for infinite wrath? From the just, holy judgment of God against sin. In the case of an unbeliever, 
that unbeliever will endure the holy, good, excellent, beautiful, unflinching wrath of God against sin forever and ever and ever without relief. And if you could just get a flavor of that, a glimpse of that for a second, you would not harbor an ounce of bitterness. You would weep and pray. And then when you're offended by a believing brother or sister, give consideration to the Lord who paid for that sin with his own infinite blood. What happened when that blood was spilled? Again, infinite wrath from God was dispensed at the cross on Christ. Leave room for the wrath. Bitterness is not an option. Vengeance is not an option. A tally of wrongs is not an option. 1 Corinthians 13 says love does not keep a record of wrongs. Let's think about the stakes of unforgiveness for a few moments this morning. There are personal consequences. We, we've talked about the slavery to bitterness that ensues if you're unforgiving. But there are others. You stunt your own spiritual growth by unforgiveness. Listen, you're not rehearsing the gospel in a way that, that cuts through the gunk. And, and that will only shorten your effectiveness and cripple your fruitfulness and rob you of joy in the Christian life. You can't have peace while you're harboring bitterness. But there are not only personal consequences, there are also corporate consequences. Broken relationships in a marriage, broken relationships between siblings, between parents and children, uh, broken relationships in the church. And all of that stunts the growth of the church. We've looked at Ephesians 4 before and God's blueprint for growth of the church. And that paragraph concludes in verse 16 with the proper working of each individual part, the church causes the growth of the church. In other words, when the individual parts malfunction, the growth of the entire body is affected. The, the spiritual vitality of the organism is crippled and hindered. And so there are corporate consequences to unforgiveness. There is also the, the consequence to a watching world of unforgiveness. The, the gospel witness is crippled. And, and for this, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> There's a specific prohibition given here in 1 Corinthians 6. But it has application to unforgiveness, and gospel witness. Listen to Paul's instructions to Corinth. Does any one of you, when he has a case against a brother, dare to be tried before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that saints will judge the world? If the world is judged by you, are you not worthy to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? So if you have law courts dealing with matters of this life, do you appoint those who are of no account in the church as judges? I say this to your shame. Is it really this way? There is not one wise man among you who will be able to pass judgment between brothers? On the contrary, brother is tried with brother, and that before unbelievers. Actually then, it is already a failure for you that you have lawsuits with one another. What's the issue? The Corinthian believers are in the secular law courts taking each other to court for justice issues. They, they can't forgive one another the debts and they go and ask the legal system in the Roman Empire who don't understand grace and the gospel and forgiveness and don't understand what we're doing on this earth to adjudicate. And what does that tell the world? We can't sort out our stuff, world. You have something we don't have. You have something we need. Fix this. I want my pound of flesh. I want this to be made right. Listen, this speaks volumes to what do we do when we're sinned against by Christians. Now look at the last phrase in verse 7. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? Christian, it is better for you to be treated unjustly, to be defrauded, to let the 8,000 bucks go, 
than to take your brother to the law courts and demand it. The world is watching. Be wronged. It's much better. The gospel's at stake in it. And then, of course, Matthew 18, where we started this, gives us the eternal stakes. Jesus, in this parable, winds up telling true future history. We move from illustration to the reality, and this is frightening. Verse 35, my heavenly Father will also do the same to you. What the Lord in the story moved with anger did to the unforgiving slave, handed him over to the tortures until he should repay all that was owed him. If each of you does not forgive his brother from the heart. Stakes are high here. You prove yourself to be unforgiving by pattern. I don't mean the residual depravity we fight with. We've got to corral our hearts. We have to ask forgiveness of God for our failure to forgive others. And then we need to repent and go forgive others. But if you are in a pattern of unbroken unforgiveness, you prove yourself to be an unbeliever and unforgiven. That's the issue. And the stakes are high. Listen, you will have opportunities to practice these things every day. You can look forward to them. I'm not suggesting that you sin against your brothers and sisters so they have opportunities. We're, we're not trying to give service opportunities here. But I can guarantee you, you will be sinned against soon. And you'll have opportunity to go cloister yourself in your room and read Matthew 18 again. To rehearse these commands, to think about the stakes and then ponder carefully what you will do next. I can cover in love with a heart of forgiveness. I can address it in love with a heart of forgiveness, seeking reconciliation and the well-being of my brother. I cannot be bitter. I cannot seek vengeance. I cannot keep a record of wrongs. Forgive. What is the manner we ought to have Again, Mark eleven twenty five 25 tells us a heart of readiness, eagerness. Even while you stand praying, forgive in your heart. And listen, if you're on the confessing side of sin, let me just put the burden on you in a certain way. It, it, you, Christian, need to put the burden on yourself on both sides of a transaction. If you are the one granting forgiveness. The, the burden is on you to think about God's grace and to be filled with a heart of love and compassion and humility and gentleness and kindness and overwhelm your brother with love. It's easy to forgive you, brother. I've been forgiven so much. I can't even remember what you owed me. That burden is on you, Christian. And when you sin against a brother, and it is time for you to go and confess your sin and make things right, the burden is still on you. Either side of this transaction of reconciliation, you do not put the burden on the other. And sometimes we do this. I, I want to confess to you something because what I really want is to manipulate a confession out of you. So I'm going to look humble for a second. I'm going to say some things and I'm going to tap my fingers, tap my toes, wait for you. Awkward silence. Okay, you fill in the blank. Your turn. And I haven't genuinely confessed. I, at that point, I, I'm revealing that I haven't actually, from the heart, thought of myself as I ought and gotten low before my brother and pleaded for mercy. I haven't been the beggar. I haven't been the, uh, the publican beating his chest before the Lord and say, have mercy on me, the sinner. I've actually been... The Pharisee, trying to show my brother the way to confess his sin to me. There's a real danger of the flesh everywhere in these transactions. And I'm not sure any of us has ever actually confessed sinlessly or forgiven sinlessly. But there's a kind of confession, a kind of repentance, a kind of forgiveness we must aim for. And I would suggest to you that when you confess your sin, you own everything that is yours. 
And you own it before the Lord first. And you own it before your brother. And it is powerful, that kind of humility. It often results in a softening of the heart of an offended brother. Gentle answer turns away wrath. Uh, A boxing metaphor, if I'm on the ground in front of you not swinging, it's kind of hard to hit me. So get low before your brother. Confess everything you know to confess and, and admit it's probably worse than you know. And you're not looking for something in return. Just selfless, empty before the Lord and before your brother. I've seen a man do this. Not sure I've ever done this right yet. But I watched a man do this in in a most exemplary way. And, And he was the brother, in my view, he was the brother that was offended far more severely than the other. And there was a broken relationship. And the the lightly offending brother took that light offense and saw it as the mountain that it was before a holy God and went and put that in front of his brother and said, not only did did I say this to you, but you couldn't see what was in my heart and it was motivated by these things and these things and these things and it lacked this and this and this and it grieves the Lord and it was awful. And, and the temptation was, I don't want to say those things because then he'll know it. But, but it's true, and the Lord knows it. Well, but, you know, what, what's somebody going to do with that? They're going to use it against me from now on. They're, they're going to walk all over me like a, like a doormat. Why not rather be wronged? And he was willing to rather be wronged. And the other brother, who had the much greater offenses was not softened. He trampled him like a doormat and used it against him for years afterwards. So, it's worship. It's one audience that matters. And you don't confess, you don't forgive to try to get something from somebody. We confess because it's right and it pleases the Lord and we forgive Because we've been forgiven an infinite debt. Because we've been commanded by our forgiving Lord to forgive one another. And because the stakes of this are so high for us personally, corporately, and even eternally. Let's pray. Oh God, would you give us hearts of compassion, gentleness, kindness, forgiveness? Would you work this hard work in us? So that your gospel would be seen in this world. So that people would look in on the church and see something different and supernatural. So that we would be liberated from bondage to bitterness. And so that we would see the power of the gospel on display in our lives. We ask all of this in the name of the one who bled and died to forgive us all our sins. Amen.